<laughs> so today is Pentecost Sunday. We are remembering the birth of the church and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And I want to read this statement because I believe it's important. We stand against racism. We stand against violence. And we cry out today, come Holy Spirit, on Pentecost Sunday. We remember how God poured out his spirit on people who were divided racially, culturally, politically, socioeconomically, and in every other way. This was the birth of the church of Jesus Christ. And we are praying for a fresh outpouring today in our time. Amen, church? I want to share a message with you today called The Wonder of God's Presence. And I want to start it off with a question. Are you regularly entering into the presence of God? Are you seeking his face? I remember when I met my wife, actually about 13 and a half years ago, we just celebrated our 13 year anniversary. I love you, honey. Very excited about that. We made it to 13. We met at a camp that we were both counselors at. And so I realized this is the woman I'm going to marry. All bets are off. I'm chasing this woman with all my heart. And then we had to go back to different areas that we lived in. We were two hours apart. So I quickly had to figure out how to get back in her presence without freaking her out too much. Who, what man here can relate with me? I was on the hunt at this point. And in full confession, I had to tell her a little bit of a made-up story. I said, Jessica, you know, I, I need to come towards your college a little bit because I, I got to go to this special music store. And it is true. There was a music store there that I needed to go to. But in full honesty, I didn't even go to the music store. I just drove right by it, went to the college. And the whole reason for the trip was to get lunch with Jessica. That was my goal, and I was successful in that goal. We went out to lunch. She did not know it was our first date, but it was, and then we hung out with some of her other friends in her dorm room for the whole rest of that Saturday. We watched much of the first season of The Office, which is still one of our favorite shows. Any Office fans in the house? All right, we like The Office. I'm not condoning everything about the show, so just fair warning, but we watched almost that whole first season. It was when it was new. And then that night, we, had, we also had dinner. So we had two dates without her even knowing it on that first day because I had the goal of getting back in Jessica's presence. And I don't, I'm not going to get too sappy on you here, but sitting at that lunch in particular, I believe it was a Texas roadhouse in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, just outside Philly. And I literally was looking in her eyes, her beautiful green eyes. I won't get too sappy. And I was realizing I was seeing the rest of my life as I sought her face. I was seeking her face. When you're seeking someone's face, you're seeking relationship. You're seeking interaction. Being in her presence changed my life forever. She was out there many years before that, but I didn't know her. When I got in her presence and when I saw her face to face, I saw clearly the rest of my life. And I've spent the rest of my life seeking her presence. And I get to be in her presence a lot now. And I want to give a brief theological lesson on the difference between omnipresence and manifest presence of God. So omnipresence is the theological term for the reality that God is everywhere at all times. God is everywhere. Manifest presence is when God makes his presence clearly known. So in Jessica's case, she had existed for about 20 years at that point in the world. So she was existing in the world, but it wasn't until I experienced her manifest presence when she was actually with me that it changed my life. Is that making sense? Give me one or two honks if that makes sense to you. Another example, I had the great privilege of visiting um, Israel a number of years ago, and I remember being out on the Sea of Galilee. So the Sea of Galilee is where... Many of the miracles of Jesus happened, and most of his life was right around that sea. And here I was out on a boat in the Sea of Galilee with one of my best friends and a number of other pastors of business leaders. And we were, it was like 7 a.m. in the morning. We were tired. There was jet lag, all these things. And as we got out into the middle of the sea, covered by some fog and mist, uh, all of a sudden, they put on a worship song. I think it was by Bethel Music, and it was the one that says, um, it was, it was a, a version of and I'm going blank on it. He, he, he still commands the winds and the waves. And as we began to sing and worship, 
I was overwhelmed with the manifest presence of God. And I looked at my friend and I said, man, the, 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 the presence of God is among us. Now, before that, God was still everywhere at once, but I wasn't necessarily in his presence in that way. But then his presence was manifestly known to me. We see his manifest presence through the whole Trinity. God the Father made his presence manifest at the burning bush with Moses. God the Son, Jesus, made his presence manifest through the incarnation when he was born as a man and his life, death, and resurrection. And the Spirit was made manifest on Pentecost Sunday around 2,000 years ago when the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the infilling of the Holy Spirit was poured out upon the people of God in the upper room and then Peter preached the gospel and 3,000 people got saved, filled with the Holy Spirit that day, and his presence became manifest to the others. And I love this quote by Dave Jenkins that says, the manifest presence of the Lord is when our awareness of him is awakened to reality as defined by him. Your first fill-in, if you're following on notes, is the presence of God is a defining reality. When we get in his presence, his presence now defines our reality. The psalm we're going to look at today was written by David. Scholars aren't totally clear on the exact context of it, but one thing is abundantly clear. He wrote this from the presence of God. So this is a prayer, a poem, a song written from David, the king of Israel, many years ago from the presence, the manifest presence of God. God. We believe the presence was upon him. Psalm 27, and it's in your notes if you want to read along. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked advanced against me to devour me, it is my enemies and my foes who will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then will I be confident. Number two is prevailing confidence is found in the presence of God. If you're not regularly seeking the face of God and entering his manifest presence, you will lose your confidence. But prevailing confidence is found in his presence as written by David. Reading on in verse four, and this is one of my favorite pieces of text in the whole Bible. David says, one thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. Now, let me clarify, when he says the house of the Lord and the temple, he's not actually talking just about the physical building. Buildings like this, this wonderful facility that we're blessed with, is only a tool He's talking about the presence of God. He's saying the thing that I desire and seek more than anything else is the presence of the living God. We are vessels of the presence of the living God. That's why it doesn't matter if you're at home in your living room or in your vehicle right now. I believe you will sense the presence of God. Number three is our singular passion is for the presence of God. I want to follow the lead of David and more importantly, the lead of Jesus. Jesus lived his life fully God and fully man, but he regularly sought the presence of his father. He would break away from the crowds, break away from the busyness and get alone in solitary places because his passion was for the presence of God. Now, let me clarify. This is not to say that we're not passionate about people and justice. Quite the contrary. It's only in the presence of God that we are transformed and then empowered to actually make a difference. I like this clarification from a pastor named Rich Velotas. He said, we need an outpouring of the spirit that does more than tickle our private religious lust for more experiences. We need the kind of outpouring that empowers us with boldness to push back the powers of sin and death. And we feel that in our current cultural moment and in our nation. I want to read a powerful quote from a well-known legendary NFL coach named Tony Dungy. He says this. He's also a follower of Christ, more importantly. America is in a very sad place today. We have seen a man die senselessly at the hands of the very people who were supposed to be protecting our citizens. We have seen people protest this death by destroying the property and dreams of people in their own community, the very people they are protesting for. We have many people pointing the fingers of blame, painting the opposite side with a broad brush. We have anger and bitterness, 
winning out over logic and reason. We have distrust and prejudice winning out over love and respect. What happened to George Floyd was inexcusable and it should never happen. Justice needs to be served, but in seeking justice, we can't fail, fall into the trap of prejudging every police officer we see. What started out as peaceful protests have developed into arson and looting, and that should never happen either. Yes, there should be protest, but we do not have license to perform criminal acts because we're angry. Today, we are a divided country. We're divided racially, politically, and socioeconomically, and Satan is laughing at us because that is exactly what he wants. Dysfunction, mistrust, and hatred help his kingdom flourish. Well, what is the answer then? I believe it has to start with those of us who claim to be Christians. We have to come to the forefront and demonstrate the qualities of the one we claim to follow, Jesus Christ. We can't be silent. As Dr. King said many years ago, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. But we can't go forward with judgmental, bitter spirits. We need to be proactive, but do it in the spirit of trying to help make things better. And it can't be just the African-American churches. It has to be all churches taking a stand and saying we are going to be on the forefront of meaningful dialogue and meaningful change. We have to be willing to speak the truth in love, but we have to recognize that we are not fighting against other people. We are fighting against Satan and his kingdom of spiritual darkness. In the words of the Apostle Paul, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And there are incredibly powerful examples of this in church history. As I mentioned earlier, when the church was born over 2,000 years ago, it was divided. It was charged politically, racially, socioeconomically, but they unified around a higher love, a higher power, a higher allegiance. And then if you trace back 100 years to the modern, revi- the modern revival movement and the pouring out of the spirit in Azusa Street, it was birthed in a racially diverse church in a seriously racially charged environment with an African-American pastor named William J. Seymour. The roots of modern revival were in a reconciling church that was rejecting racism. There's a quote from a friend of mine, John Tyson. This was 100 years ago, and the same needs to be true of us today as we call out for a new outpouring. Number four is this, reconciliation, unity, and justice flow from the presence of God. Reading on in verse 5 of the psalm. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent and set me high upon a rock. This is a key promise. We've been looking at these promises this year. Number five, our guaranteed shelter is in the presence of God. Guaranteed shelter. It doesn't mean we won't go through hardship. We will. But we have guaranteed promised shelter. Reading on in verse 6. Then my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me. At his sacred tent, I will sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. Hear my voice when I call, Lord. Be merciful to me and answer me. My heart says of you, seek his face. Your face, Lord, I will seek. Number six, our primary pursuit is the presence of God. I love what the psalmist said. My heart says of you, seek his face. There's something in your heart and there's something in my heart that longs for the transcendent presence of God. Your heart, whether you've realized it or not, says to you, seek his face. We seek a lot of other things looking for transcendence, looking for life, looking for hope, looking for relief, looking to medicate, looking to find some answer, some solution. But the only place where we find that is in the face of of the living God, the face of Jesus, and the pouring out of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So the the psalmist said, I'm going to respond to the cry of my heart and seek the face of God. And my hope for myself is that more more than the passion I saw at the face of my wife, I will seek the face of God today. May I seek the face of God more than anything else in my life. And then finishing up with the psalm in verse 9, do not hide your face from me. Lord, do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my helper. Do not reject me or forsake me, God my Savior. Though my father or mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. Teach me your way, Lord. Lead me in a straight path because of my oppressors. 
Do not turn me over to the desire of my foes, for false witnesses rise up against me, spouting malicious accusations. I remain confident of this, the psalmist says. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. So number seven, the last principle today is our unwavering hope is found in the presence of God. And let me just say, I don't know where you are today. I don't know where you find yourself, but I am a pastor's kid. And on my mom's side, I'm a fourth generation pastor's kid. So I've been in church my whole life. I was basically born in a pew, if you catch my drift. But I did not know the actual manifest presence of God for many years of my life. I heard the words of God. I heard the truth of the gospel preached but it did not land yet because I was not yet in the presence of God. I'll tell you though, at 12 years old, I had an experience in the presence of God. I was gripped by the story of Peter walking on the water and I went to my bedroom that was trashed like a normal 12 year old and I opened up to the gospel where it talked about Peter walking on the water to pursue Jesus and then a falling and crying out for Jesus to save him, save him. And I put a worship song on repeat in my room and I got on my knees in my room as a little 12 year old and, I, and I, I felt the presence of the living God. And it's more than feeling. His presence was made manifest to me and I wept. It felt like hours, it was probably like five minutes, but it was so powerful, it marked my life. It didn't change my life yet. And then years later when I was 15 years old, me and my bandmates had no interest in the things of God. All we were interested in was our band and girls, to be honest with you. And we ended up at this youth group uh, Super Bowl party and they invited us up into a room to pray because we were talking about what the Holy Spirit was as the Super Bowl was going on. And, and a few of the leaders gathered over me and my two bandmates and prayed for us. And we, f we, we, we were overwhelmed with the presence of God fell to our knees and began calling on the Lord. Still didn't totally change my life. Then when I was 17, two years later, I really became an honest seeker. And I said, Lord, if you're real, I wanna know. And guess what? He answers the prayers of honest seekers. So if you will seek him today, if you will say, God, I resolve to seek you more than anything else. I resolve to seek your face. And let me say, in light of the political and the cultural unrest, if you feel yourself getting defensive or, or getting angry yourself, let me encourage you to pray the prayer of David in a different psalm. Make this your prayer. Search me, God. Know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. That humility will lead you right into the presence of the living God. And God will be able to touch you and transform you and change you so that you can then go out to the, into the world and make a proactive difference. Actually love people. We don't have to respect, respond in defense or in anger. God has called us to be the hands and feet of Jesus, but we can only do that when we're going out from being in his presence. Are you tracking with me, church? This is the way. This is the only way. And you may not even know Jesus today. You may be watching. You may be with us here live. Put your faith in him. Just simply pray as I'm talking. Lord, I, I don't understand all this, but I feel a lot of things right now. And I don't want them in me. I don't want this to be the way of my life. So search me, God. Know me, God. I'm thankful that you do know me and you still love me. I ask for forgiveness for where I have fallen short. I want to follow you, Jesus, for the rest of my days. Help me with that. Thank you for making a way for me. I ask to be filled with your Holy Spirit. Wherever you are, church, wherever you're listening, let's just make this our prayer. Lord, we want a fresh outpouring of your Spirit. We need your presence above all other things. We need you to soften our hearts, transform our minds. We need your miraculous intervention in our nation. And we call on you, God. There is no other solution. There is no other way. You are the way, the truth, and the life. We pray for revival in our nation. We pray for spiritual awakening. We pray for a move of your spirit, God, that transforms our country. There's no other solution. We ask for it. We cry out for it. Let's continue praying as we sing, Holy Spirit, church. Lord, I pray for the outpouring of your spirit on every person here with us on our property on every person watching god i pray you will do miracles in our hearts god that as we turn our faces toward you to seek your face 
Would you meet us in new and powerful and fresh ways? Would you, would, would you blow out the old ways of our thoughts and our hearts? Would you just move that out from us and fill us with your heart and your thoughts? God, transform every person. Make us new. For those who are starting a journey of following you right now, God, I pray that you would just draw them. I pray that they would be overwhelmed like I was when I realized I had to pursue my wife, that they would pursue you, God. You are our future. You are our life, Lord. When we look into your eyes, your face, your kingdom, your plan, God, only then do we see clearly the rest of our life, the rest of eternity. Only then do we see clearly Lord, we may not understand circumstantially, but we see clearly. We see you. We have peace. We have hope. We mourn with those who mourn and we grieve, but we do not grieve as those without hope. We do it as those with hope. We have hope. We have the guarantee, the promise of reconciliation, justice, unity. We thank you for it. Church, just a closing thought before I pray this benediction. Be careful with how much news you watch. (laughs) Just be careful with it. For me, it's stuff like Twitter, even Facebook, whatever it may be, television. Um, Don't see it as entertainment. Don't use it as that. Be careful what you fill your mind with constantly. I think a healthy approach is use it to get information and then go into the presence of God. (laughs) Then fill your heart and mind with the word of God. Because you'll get charged up. You'll get charged up by one side or the other. You'll get charged up by people doing things that don't represent others well. You'll get charged up by the anger and hatred of others. Don't let it in your heart. Don't let it in your mind. Don't let that dominate. Let God's word and his presence shape you. Let it soften your heart. Let it fill your mind with truth. Last night, I had a hard time getting to bed because I was just watching all the videos from all the cities around our country. And um, I had already been, as you guys, mourning the death of our brother. And I had to eventually just get on my knees on the side of my bed and put my phone away and just seek the face of God and he meets us right where we are he'll meet you right where you are Um, I'm honored that you were with us today we'd love to follow up with you if you're a new follower of Christ if you're newly just saying God I want to be filled by your spirit let us know use the online connection card we'll be in touch with you we'd love to pray with you the church has not been shut down through this whole thing we're not planning on reopening because we've never been shut down right (laughs) exactly The team knows it. (laughs) We've been working harder than we've ever worked. (laughs) We're not shut down. We want to minister to you. We want to love you. We want to get on the phone call with you. We want to serve you and pray with you. Please reach out to us. Any of you guys that want to join tonight beyond our walls at the Ag Expo Park, 6 p.m., make sure to come early. I'm going to pray this benediction over us and we'll be dismissed. Go out into the world and labor to bring forth new life. Dream dreams, pursue visions, and speak of God's goodness in the words of those who would hear. And may the God who breathed life into creation be your delight. May Christ Jesus give hope to your dreaming. And may the Holy Spirit, your advocate and supporter, set your hearts ablaze with a passion for peace. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Love you guys very much. Have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you for joining us online. We'll see you next week.